Good evening. Uh, I'm Leopold Zer, and I'm a professor of kinesiology and neuroscience. This is the study of human movement. I practice that study in my, in my own research activities and in my uh, academic pursuits at university, as well as in my daily life, where I've been practicing martial arts for over 30 years. And I'm going to tell you tonight that exercise is evil. And what I want to talk to you about is why would I say something like that? Something provocative like exercise is evil. Evil has a very, very severe tone to it. But so does the concept of exercise. Exercise, you say the word, it sounds like something extra, something additional, something added to, something that maybe you can not do or avoid, or what is it anyways? And I want to talk about that concept of why this feeling about exercise maybe is an evil, insidious sort of concept that's, that's in our society. And you know what? It all has to do with the concept of efficiency. And um, when it comes to efficiency, we really think about something that sounds good again. Evil sounds bad. Efficiency sounds good. We don't usually say somebody's efficient or that's a really efficient way to do something and mean it in a negative way. It's usually a positive thing. And it is positive and efficiency is great. And our bodies, our biological bodies, uh, the, the organisms that we are and all biological life on the planet is tremendously efficient and through evolutionary pressures has over uh, the uh, years and, and years that we've had life on Earth emerged to become amazingly efficient. And it's this strive towards efficiency that is actually part of our problem. Because the concept of efficiency gave rise to the issue of mechanical efficiency. And mechanical efficiency uh, in the sense of what we saw in the 19th century and the dawn of the Industrial Revolution gave rise to things such as uh, the steam engine, which we see here. This basic idea of trying to do more with less. The idea that um, we could maybe create some machines and some mechanized activities that would help us uh, power our machines, do things that were good for us, free up time to do other things, certainly get away from some of the labor that was inherent in a lot of the activities we were trying to do at the time, back uh, when the Industrial Revolution came along and James Watt refined the steam engine. When we go from, from this sort of concept of um, the steam engine back in uh, the 19th century and, and the turn of the century, when we get to the 20th century, we have other inventions, other bits of technology that come into play, um, such as one that you know, is the most common thing we can think of, which is our automobile. Here's an example of a 1908 um, Ford Model T, one of the, the, the first uh, automobiles that was commercially available. And again, we think of the efficiency here, the things that we can do when we've got these kind of devices. We can get out and do many more things than we could previously, and we're able to do them easier and in faster time. Which takes us then from, from this concept to uh, our current century, where we are living now, currently, thinking about what we have. And now we can do all kinds of things with our technology. And in fact, we can find ourselves uh, in very, very uh, special places, even in the sense of being in space. Um, this is an image taken from Project Superhero, which is illustrated by Chris Pern. Um, and had to do with this person shown here is Nicole Stott, who was a NASA astronaut that I interviewed as part of the, this book uh, and the, the research for it. And one of the things I wanted to talk to Nicole Stott about was she spent many, many months through numerous missions uh, on the International Space Station. And what was interesting is I talked to her about what it was like to live up on the space station. And in particular, she related the common thing that many astronauts will talk about, which is the idea that they get like two hours of activity they're supposed to do when they're in space, working out, doing all kinds of things, which turns out to be actually much more than Nicole related, for example, she had time to do when she was on Earth. And yet, when she came back to Earth, she described trying to get up after landing on the space shuttle as just being able to stand now in Earth's gravity again, back in the situation where she was in microgravity and there was no mechanical stress on that body of hers, she could hardly ever stand up. The biggest sort of most physically demanding thing she'd ever done was to stand up after coming back to Earth. And that's because when we're thinking of the situation of living up in space, we've lost the stress of life. And again, I'm throwing lots of words out here, stress again. If I keep standing here just saying stress to you and saying that we should talk about stress and I want to talk about the stress of life and are we all getting stressed and are you getting stressed when I say stress? If I say stress, does it make you feel stressed? Are you getting stressed now? Should I stop? Are you stressed? <laughs> You're getting stressed, right? But again, we think stress is bad, but in fact, stress in a physiological sense, in a biological sense, is life. 
our cells, the way they function, what they do, how they, what they will do, how they will grow and develop, how our bodies will function, is all a function of the stresses that have been applied to them by what we've been doing by being alive, whether it's standing up on Earth or trying to do activity in space. And when we are in these different kinds of environments, like outer space, it really emphasizes the idea that something major was taken away from astronauts when they're in space. The force of gravity acting on their bodies, a background uh, activity level was taken away, and we lose this kind of concept of the stress of life. And that becomes an issue because people are animals too. We are just like all other biological organisms on this planet, and our, our cells, as I said, function, all of our processes are so efficient, and function in this context of needing stresses to tune them in specific ways to keep us alive and to keep us as functioning animals in the world. The problem is, though, while we are animals in the world, we actually live in a zoo. We are in a zoo in the sense of being in a place where we imagine I've got nothing against zoos per se, but if we think about the concept of a zoo, what we've done is taken a situation where the normal things that animals do, escape from predators or hunt prey or go get food, or find shelter are no longer necessary activities because all that's provided. So what we think of when I say people are animals too and they live in a zoo is we're living in this constrained environment where we don't have to do any of those kind of things that provide the stress of life that gives rise to the things that we need to do to keep our biological bodies functioning and to keep us alive as species in the world as the animals that we really are. So what are we going to do if we live in a zoo? Well, in the zoo zone, I've got a few ideas. So that's where we are, in the zoo zone. I played around with a couple of ideas for the title for this. I had a long time trying to figure out, is there a word? I, I like alliteration. It's a weakness of mine. And I was thinking about, is there something we can do to rhyme words together? And finally, I did arrive at I'm actually pretty OK with in the zoo zone. Prior to this, it was the menagerie memorandum, <laughs> which I thought was a bit too long, but menagerie being a synonym for uh, zoo. So anyways, we've got in the zoo zone instead. What are we going to do? Well, here's some ideas. Stand instead of sit. Do something where you're using your body more effectively if you can. Stand instead of sit transforms also when we go from the concept of stand. What would come additional to that? Walk instead of stand. What would come additional to the concept of walking instead of standing? We come to the idea of running instead of riding. What I'm actually trying to say here comes back to what I started with. Except I started with the concept of efficiency as a good idea. I'm actually saying in the zoo zone what we have to do is learn to do the opposite. We need to be inefficient. Our society that we live in, in this zoo zone concept, is already highly efficient. We are in this situation where our bodies are highly efficient. But it's efficient in the wrong context for providing the mechanical stresses of life that we need to be alive in the world and to be functioning as best we can as those species we were talking about. So we need to strive toward becoming more efficient and trying to do more whenever we possibly can. Come back to that example. In space, those astronauts are actually doing more exercise each day than they ever did on Earth. And yet, they come back and they're heavily deconditioned because they've lost the background stress. They're doing that exercise. And that's why exercise, the concept that we mostly have about exercise, is evil in the sense of what does it mean to just take a, 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 the idea of doing some activity and thinking that if we just do a little workout, it'll offset the fact of taking away the activities we normally do in our daily lives. So the concept of is exercise evil really comes from this idea of the context being something different from what we're intending it to be. So as I've said here, with um, exercise being evil, I'm saying it in an ironic sense, of course, because we really do need to be active, but we really do need to remember that we can't just imagine that a little exercise bout is actually going to offset living in the zoo. Instead, we need to participate in our lives fully as animals that we are in the world. And that means going beyond uh, just simple exercise bouts. And I want to close off with a, a quote from one of my all-time favorite scientists, Sir Charles Sherrington, who was a Nobel laureate. He was the father of neurophysiology. He was a philosopher. Um, he's basically my my own personal superhero of science. And he wrote all kinds of amazing things, but this is one particular quote that's relevant here. He said, to move is all mankind can do, whether in whispering a syllable or in felling a forest. 
the basic idea of biological organisms alive in the world. And I'm urging you, as members of our species, to take back your heritage as an animal in the world and live more fully beyond the concept of exercise being evil. Yes, it is evil, but it's a necessary evil for us to imagine that we have to participate in if we want to be biological organisms in our society and in our world. Thank you very much.